today we're going to have a proper look at the Grundig Sonoclock 350. Okay, so like I said, we're going to look at this Grundig clock radio and we had one that had missing buttons and we had another one that didn't seem to light up at all. Well, I'm confused, I'll be honest, because I've put this one on the bench and this one appears to work. There is only one fault that I can find at the moment, and that is one of the digits on the clock actually stays on, because at the moment it's saying it's 1164, and it's just that one segment of the LED display that's causing a problem. Now, I can turn it on and bring up the volume. Medium wave. And if I switch it the country's constitutional court to FM, Felix we have radio as well. Disputed presidential election. The tone control which I thought originally was a stereo pan control, seems to be a bit intermittent, so we can deal with that. Uh, the volume control, that seems to work perfectly fine. The two switches on the front, the um, on and automatic, are both working. The buttons for setting the alarm, the day, the date, the hours, the minutes, and the sleep function are all working, so we've got no problems there. The other thing that I thought was a tone control, the little uh, control, is actually a dimmer for the display, and it's quite sensitive because it has a light-dependent resistor coupled to it, so if you cover the resistor, it automatically detects whether it's night, and then darkens the display for you. So actually quite a nice design of clock. Now we still have the hum. Between um, uh, opposition leader Tisha Katie um, and the outgoing regime, with the thought being that Tisha Katie... Which sounds to me like filter capacitors. Now this Grundig Sonoclock clock 350 was actually made in 1977, which makes it about 41 years old. It could be at the start of 77, could be at the tail end but they made these according to the manual from the year 1977. I don't know how long they continued the series or whether they did much to it but I did manage to get hold of the full service manual in multiple languages and it even tells you how to take the thing apart. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over and take it apart. Okay, so here we are back again, the lid is off, and I even followed the safety instructions. It says to unplug it from the mains when you're going to take the lid off, and I did. I must be sickening for something. Here's the top open, and let's just run through what we've got. We have a Grundig branded mains transformer which is quite a nice touch actually to see something made by the same manufacturers as the kit and that all feeds in on this multi-way connector here. This goes through the two fuses, there's a bridge rectifier, there's a couple of diodes down here as well and one side goes off to the radio to fix, uh, to supply power, the other side here is to supply the clock and what you'll have is you'll have power and you'll also have the on off for the clock uh, for the radio section when the timer circuit kicks in so if the timer says switch the radio on then the signal will come along through here it's actually very typically german and exceedingly well made if you look at the control on the side here for the band change that actually moves this string which actually connects to a lens which has a light behind it and that actually tells you what wave band you're on now a lot of 
clock radios of that era would only have the markings on the side. They wouldn't actually tell you what wave band you were on on the front. But uh, this is what uh, Grundig did. You also know that this cam here is what pushes the wave band selector switch in this radio. So it's a string to the front, but a mechanical cam which makes this part move, which is a really, really nice way of doing it. Now, it's given its tension by this spring, which is basically a piece of upright metal, and it just clicks the two wave bands and moves it across, dependent on where it is. So what else have you got? You've got all the resistors, um, rather than being flush to the board, they're raised above the board. And again, full air spacing around them so heat can dissipate. They, they will just last. You have um, the audio chip here. Um, this is actually a TBA 570, but they also used a TDA 1080, I believe, was an alternate for that chip. We'll probably end up changing these three electrolytics here just to try and cure the hum that uh, it picks up on the uh, from the power supply. As I say, it comes through this bridge rectifier and into the filter caps, and these will be the culprits for that. That really is the RF deck. You've then got this part here, which is the clock deck. Now, I haven't actually gone through too much on how to remove that yet, but I believe you tip that one up, you unplug the mains, you unplug the loudspeaker, you unplug the power supply, and this whole board, well, you pull out the antenna as well, and you unplug the battery power, and this whole unit comes out complete as one piece. You can get to the bottom of the circuit board incredibly easily. There's no problem with the servicing side of this. You've got some conductive paint here which connects to the RF deck there, which makes everything nice and uh, shielded. So let's get rid of that and let's look at the RF deck for now. I'm going to put that on the floor. So we've got the RF deck out and everything there, oh there's a couple more electrolytics tucked in at the front. Now if I'm replacing if I'm replacing one, two, three, four, I might as well do seven. Uh, let's have a look inside the bit that is causing us a problem. Nothing needs incredible force and if the manual is correct there is the exposed clock board, the clock chip and I see we actually have a couple more smoothing capacitors in here, one there, one there and we're going to look for a short circuit somewhere on that first LED, or that second LED module here, which is going to be this one here. Now, with any luck, it's going to be a problem with the LED module or a short circuit on the back of this board. Now, the flux may have gone conductive since it was made so I may well just clean the board and the fault might disappear and I can actually take the R the clock deck out that's just a matter of unclipping the plastic tags at the back and there is the clock deck with its associated uh, pull down resistors or current limiting resistors for each of the LED display elements and a couple of transistors. These are obviously the switches. There is the light dependent resistor for the front panel dimming. 
and as you can see it's come apart with no real issues and servicing wise very straightforward so let's let's get the parts do some replacements and see how it goes okay so we've got all the capacitors in stock and i've put them at the side of the bench here and every single one i've got is uprated voltage wise from the ones that are in here and that's purely a physical thing it's it's something that i didn't need to do but uh, seeing as i've got the higher voltage rated ones why not use them um, we're not talking silly i'm not using 400 volt capacitors in a place where there's only a 16 volt capacitor but um for example this one here that i'm just about to drag out this is a 25 volt 220 microfarad or 2200 microfarad and what i'm going to do is i'm going to put another 2200 microfarad in there but uprate it to 35 volts so that will give me just that little bit of extra voltage room in there so let's just take the board make sure that we put it the right way round minus to there positive to there so let's get our solder first of all we'll touch up that one I'm just going to push it in tight to make sure it is flush against the board like that and we'll push that one in Okay, so I've actually taken the front panel off now, and the reason for that is because it's the easiest way to get into the switches with the switch cleaner. So rather than move any of the controls there, I'm just going to get in there, and give it a quick burst, inside the sliders. Now I sh could get them from the back if I was really sort of struggling but these are actually open track pots so I'm just going to put a little bit of cleaner either side of where the wiper is. Now, one thing that was interesting is this, the capacitor. When I was changing this capacitor on the clock deck, this was the one that came out. Now, this one has evidence of soldering iron marks. So I don't know whether somebody's been in here with a soldering iron and by the fresh solder on that particular board, I'm wondering if they had. But uh, looking closely, I'm not sure but where the second LED digit is, which is these four pins and these four pins, I think I can see 
a possible solder bridge. So I'm going to look closely I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflow those joints just enough to take enough solder on there just to get it so that I can actually take off all the old solder examine the board again. Now as I said before this board has a lot of flux on it so I'm going to get the alcohol and a cotton bud and just start to dissolve any flux that may have gone conductive Just get a bit of kitchen roll. Do the front surface of the LEDs themselves. Like that. And I'm going to get in to the back of these switches with a bit of contact cleaner. And the easiest way for that seems to be again just through the front. But we've still got that we've still got that segment lit. Let me get the manual, let me start digging and see where we go. Okay, so here we have the schematic diagram, and like the radio, the diagram is incredibly descriptive. We know that the LED module involved is the third one from the left, second one from the right, and if we look here on the diagram, you can actually see this is seen from the solder side, so this would be the most, the right hand most one, this would be the one next to it. So we're looking at LED 103. Now we also know what segment is faulty, and the segment that's faulty is this one, E, which is on number one. So we need to find the connection for LED 103, number E, which goes from here. And if we look at the board, we can have a look. Here's 101, 102, LED 103. So we only need this part of the diagram. And we're looking for the one that says E, which is here. Now that goes straight from connector 2M straight to the LED from the chip. There's a resistor in line, an 820, which is R132, and we know that M Two. Here is connector two. It's M. It's this one. Okay. At this point, I think we'll cut a long story short. Here's an image of the circuit diagram, and I've coloured a few bits in. Now, the red line that comes in and goes right round the white block in the centre 
is actually straight from the power supply. It comes straight in off the transformer through a diode and then supplies a common rail to all of the LEDs and quite a few transistors and other bits and pieces. But generally speaking, it's a straight run to all of the LED segments. The blue box shows the segment that we're having the problems with. And what you have in that blue box is you have the common rail going to the top of the LED. Then you have the 820 ohm current limiting resistor. And then the chip. There's no other switching at all. So we know the LED is good. We know the resistor must be passing voltage and current because the segment is lighting up. We know the power supply is good because the rest of the segments light up. The only thing that can be at fault is the chip itself. What I did was I took out the original one, that one, and took the other one out of the other clock with the missing controls. And as you can see, it's fixed the problem. So it looks like this original IC is actually faulty. Now, for the other clock, what I've done is I've actually ordered a replacement and the shipping is almost as much as the price of the IC. Uh, if I went to eBay, they want around about £30 for the IC because obviously it's obsolete, it's a 1970s chip. But there's a guy in Poland who's selling them online for five pounds. So guess what I where I went to buy one? I went to Poland. So that should be coming in the post. They say within the next three or four days. But as of now, I would say that this particular clock is fixed. We just have to put it back together now. Okay, so I've changed the lighting in here slightly probably look a little bit redder because there's no bright light shining in my face but yeah so here is the radio and what I'll do is um, it is switched on at the moment but the volume's down bass treble is in the middle and here we go if that doesn't wake you up nothing will um, it's very 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 loud um, <laughs> what can I say? It's incredibly loud. If I cover the sensor, obviously the display doesn't dim that much, but if I bring the brightness down to the point where it just starts to dim, as I cover it, I don't know how well the cover, the camera is picking that up, but you should see, if I point it more at that camera, you should see that it actually gets dimmer once I cover up the sensor. If you like this video, leave a comment. Tell me what you liked about it. If you didn't like this video, by all means, click the thumbs down twice. That's a really good way of telling me you really hate that. But otherwise, just leave a comment. If you don't like it, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I can't fix it if you don't tell me. There we go. We have a working Grundig Summer Clock 350 clock radio from 1977. Thanks very much for watching. Click like, click subscribe. Do all the usual things like ring the bell, leave comments. I don't know. Send me loads of cash in the post. Lottery tickets. Um, your firstborn child. I'll, I'll, I'll accept all of those. Thanks very much. Bye for now.